I really want to talk about two lessons I've learned about making spiritual progress. The first one is very simple. All progress in the Christian life is by faith. And there is no other way to advance but by faith. I, I, I may have shared with some of you, but the Lord taught me that in a very specific and definite and personal way. My wife and I had been on the mission field in East Africa for five years, and we returned to Europe, and we were on our way to Canada, where we were going to do what they call deputation work, traveling through the churches, speaking about the mission field. And we spent Christmas with my wife's sister in Denmark, and for the first time for a good long while, I had no ministry responsibility. And there's a particular cliff overlooking the North Sea in that area of Denmark, which is Jutland, the northern tip of, of Denmark, that I have loved for many years. And I, I used to like to go out on the cliff and walk up and down and praise the Lord and speak in tongues and release my spirit. And I had no problems because there was nobody there but a few seagulls. And I've always gone on well with seagulls. Um, so I was up there just around about Christmas time, 1961 or the beginning, 1962, I think. And the Lord began to speak to me, not audibly, but very, very clearly with clear, precise words which came somewhere inside me. I'm sure most of you will understand what I'm talking about. And he gave me a little review of my past life and service for him, reminded me of the various things that had happened, and he concluded something like this. Now, you've been a missionary in two countries. You're the principal of a college. You're the member of a denomination. You have a pension scheme. And then he said, are you satisfied or do you want to go further? Well, that was an unexpected and rather shocking question because at that time I really didn't think there was much further to go. I looked back with shame and embarrassment, but I really thought basically I knew whatever I needed to know. I mean, I knew there were lots of things in the Bible I didn't understand, but I thought from the point of view of practical ministry, I knew everything that was necessary. I knew about salvation, healing, baptism in the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Spirit. I believed in the authority of the Word of God. I believed that the Scripture teaches Jesus Christ is coming back again in person to receive his church and judge the world. I believed all those things. I'd preached them. I'd seen them work. I knew they produced results. And I wasn't interested in being super spiritual and getting to know a lot of things that were not of practical value. But the Lord said to me, are you satisfied or do you want to go further? Well, one of the things I have learned is do not speak rashly to God. If you look in the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes, and you don't need to turn there now, but it says in, es in essence that whatever we say to God on earth is recorded by an angel. And one day when we stand before God, the record of what we said is going to be there to meet us. And Ecclesiastes says, don't say it was a mistake and you didn't mean it, because it will be too late. So my response to God was, well, I need time to think this over. And so I went away and I thought it over and I meditated on it and I prayed about it for about two or three days. And then I went back to the same cliff top by myself and I got in touch with the Lord and I said, I'm ready to give you my answer. And this is what I said. And again, I really am embarrassed to think, but this is actually what I said. I said, Lord, if there is anything further, <laughs> I want to go further. And the Lord was ready with his answer. And he gave me a very precise immediate practical answer. He said, if you want to go further, there are two conditions. First of all, all progress in the Christian life is by faith. And if you're not willing to go forward in faith, you cannot go forward. Secondly, he said, if you are to fulfill the ministry that I have for you, you will need a strong, healthy body, and you're putting on too much weight. And mind you, that was Denmark at Christmas time. <laughs> And if anybody knows how to celebrate Christmas, it's the Danes, from the point of view of food. Well, I'm deeply grateful to God for what he told me. And by his grace, I have succeeded in avoiding putting on too much weight. In fact, I think I weigh a little less now than I did then. I met a lot of people that had to go to the doctor to be told that and pay for it. I got my consultation free. Well, when I said that to God... Without fully realizing it, I made a commitment. In a sense, I said, all right, you take over. I'll go where you leave. And it entirely changed the direction of my life. 
In the ordinary course of events, I would have spent a year on furlough in deputation work in Canada. I was a missionary of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada at the time, and uh, I would have gone back to East Africa for another four or five year tour of mission work. But when I came to Canada, I traveled right across the whole Dominion from east to west, from St. John's, Newfoundland to Victoria, Vancouver Island, which is about 4,000 miles, and I was invited down to the United States. I have some things you can only say in some places, and I suppose this is all right to say this here, but the difference between the Canadians and Americans is, is very interesting. And I mean, you know, I'm neither Canadian nor American by origin, I'm English. I spent a year in Canada, and they were polite. You know, they were appreciative. Thank you, that was a nice message. I came to the United States for three days, and they said, can't you come here? Come to us. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. You're welcome. It was really remarkable. And one man, who was a lawyer from Richmond, Virginia, said, can I make a tape of what you say? Well, I didn't know much about tapes in those days. So I said, okay. And he, I gave my testimony, and he made a tape of it. And I suppose I myself have probably sold 10,000 copies of that tape, apart from anybody else. Um, and thousands of others have gone around. Well, I went back to Canada, and I began to get letters from all over the United States, from people I didn't know, and places I'd never even heard of. I had to look at the map to find out where they were. Why don't you come down to the United States? Well, I had no intention of doing it, but I had a disagreement with the people that I was working with. I felt they had failed to keep a commitment, a very solemn commitment that they made, and I felt, in a sense, I was released, so I arranged to come down to the United States, to Minneapolis, for just a six-month visit. And this is an example of the things you don't plan. When we got to the border, which was somewhere in North Dakota, um, the immigration man said, how long are you coming for? I said, six months. He said, what kind of a visa do you have? I said, a visitor's visa. He said, six months is too long for a visitor's visa. And I had with me my wife and Joska. Is Joska here today? Joska, are you there anywhere? She's at work. Well, Joska was then four years old. And she didn't have a passport. She didn't have any papers. She just had us. So I, I've had a lot of dealings with uh, officials of governments in different countries, especially getting people in and out of countries without passports. It's been one of my ministries. <laughs> so I've learned, don't argue. So I said to the immigration, I said, well, maybe you could help us. And he took a look at me and my wife and Jessica. I think he really felt sorry for this strange company of people. So I said, come in and we'll see what we can do. So that's how I got to the United States, and about July of that year, I was officially admitted as an immigrant with my wife and Joska. Well, I know, had I applied from outside the country to get in with Joska, we would never have been admitted, because she didn't have a passport, she didn't have a thing. But that was God's way of getting us in. And that's an illustration of what I'm saying. When God plans a thing, it works, and it works much better than we plan it. So I came for a six-month visit in 1963, and I've lived here ever since. And I always like to say I am deeply grateful to the United States of America because they have been very, very good to me. I would have to say, honestly, much better than my own people. Let others criticize America and say what they will. I've lived in many countries, and I know many different cultures, and I'm grateful to be American. I became a citizen in 1970. I'm still a British citizen, too, and I respect and honor my own country. But the opportunities for Christians in this country, as far as I'm concerned, are unique. There is no other country on earth where Christians have the same privileges and opportunities as that they do in this. And if you're a Christian in America, you should thank God for your nation. I know America has problems. I'm aware of them. But nevertheless, the opportunities are unequal that I know of in any other nation. And I grew up, in, I was born in India, grew up in Europe, I've lived in Africa, I've lived in Israel. I'm not without experience. So, that was a complete change of the whole direction of my life. And uh, God gave me what I would call a postgraduate course. I think I had graduated, but he put me back. And I began to know there were things in the Bible I didn't even know were there. I wouldn't have known a demon. It handed me one on a plate. <laughs> God adjusted that. And for about four or five years, he gave me a very thorough education in demonology. Not theory, believe me, but practice. 
And I, looking back, I realized God would take me right across the continent just to meet one person and see one situation and learn one lesson. Then he'd take me somewhere else. That was one area of education. The other area really was more important in the long run, and that was the nature of the church. And I'm still being educated in that area. I was at that time when the Lord dealt with me, I was really a fanatical Pentecostal. Um, I really believed that very few people except the Pentecostals were going to go to heaven. I couldn't conceive of a Roman Catholic going to heaven. I mean, I'm, I say that with a certain amount of embarrassment and shame, but I actually just could not imagine that a Roman Catholic would go to heaven. And I didn't think many Anglicans or Episcopalians were going, believe me. Having spent 20 years in the Anglican Church. <laughs> well, God has given me a new insight to a lot of things. And I don't really want to dwell on that, but I just want to point out that none of that would ever have happened if I hadn't given God the authority in my life to lead me on. And I, what I'm saying is this, God will not force you. He'll lead you if you're willing to be led. And when I look back at that moment on that cliff stop, when I said, I'm willing to go further, I think that was one of the most important moments in my whole life. And it was a commitment. And that's how you go forward. You go forward in faith, or you don't go forward. There is no alternative. The moment you come to a place, where you're not willing to step out in faith, you've come to the end of spiritual program. Let me take another illustration. The Lord spoke to me just recently. Every now and then, the Lord really speaks to me personally. When I say speaks to me, it's usually he'll give me an utterance in an unknown tongue, and then he'll give me the interpretation. While my wife was alive, usually he would give her the tongue and give me the interpretation. But since then, he's given me both. I don't seek it. It usually comes at a time when I'm not even expecting it. In fact, when I think I'm most spiritual, I usually hear least from God. <laughs> and when I'm doing something like brushing my teeth, I get a real revelation. Because <laughs> I think one of the things to hear from God is you have to be relaxed. I don't think you can be all tense and religious and hear from God. And the Lord spoke to me and he said he would open to me new doors, lift me onto new levels, and show me new vistas. And I believe that. I want him to know tonight, I believe it. And that gives me another picture. In a certain sense, the spiritual life is in a series of plateaus or levels. And when God has got you to the place where he wants you on a higher level, again, it's faith. You have to step up. And there'll always be a certain pressure against you at that point. I don't know whether there are any of you here that are really specifically called to service in, in God, like to be an evangelist, to be a missionary, whatever it may be. I will tell you, the time between your call and the time you get into your calling will be one of the hardest times you'll ever go through. Every kind of pressure will come against you. And that's God's mercy. Because if you can't hold out, it's better not to go through. There is that. It's really like a birth. They say if you help a chick out of the egg, I don't know, I've never tried it. It doesn't have the strength to live when it gets out. It has to make its way out. And I really believe that's true in the spiritual. Every time you're going to go forward, the pressures will come against you. It's God's mercy that you don't go forward unless you've got what it takes when you get there. I'll give you just another different kind of example. Very down to earth. Um, some people might consider it unspiritual. It depends whether you think money is unspiritual or not. Personally, I don't. As Jesus said, if you're not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, which is money, no one will commit to your trust the true riches. In other words, money is a testing ground. Well, this happened about four years ago, I would think, four or five years ago, much the same time, just a little after we, I first came to Kansas City here. My wife and I were living in the best house we'd ever lived in. Let me tell you this story, too. When we came to the United States, we hadn't owned our own home ever in our lives. We had never owned our own car. Yes, once. I owned my mother's car for a few years. It was 21 years old when I got it. <laughs> we didn't have any money in the bank. And when we stepped out from the Pentecostal Assembly of Canada, we didn't have any insurance. We didn't have any medical insurance. We didn't have anything except the Lord. But when you have the Lord, that's quite a lot. So when we got to Seattle, which was the second city we lived in after we left Minneapolis, 
We rented a little white frame house from the president of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship of their brother, Fred Dorfline. That was a cute little house, very simple. And we were so happy that we thought this was just the ultimate in houses. So I was sitting there just praising God for being in that house, and he spoke to my spirit very, very clearly. And he said, I have something much better for you. <laughs> so I thought to myself, what could that be? You know, I... So... We went from city to city and place to place, and in 1968 we ended up in Fort Lauderdale, and we bought a real nice house. I, many of you, quite a number of you have seen it when you were down there. It was a double corner lot, beautiful white Florida style house, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, etc., etc. We put in central air conditioning, so we thought, I thought, now this is it, this must be. But after we'd lived there about two or three years, we began to get restless. It wasn't that we were dissatisfied. We loved the house. My wife said, I never want to move to another house. But we just had that strange kind of restlessness. So she said, maybe we, the Lord wants us to get another house. So I said, well, there's no harm to look at a few houses, get in touch with some real estate people. And we did. This is just, by the way, this has got nothing to do with the principles of the story, but <laughs> we, uh, we had... Uh, a visit from two real estate ladies that actually sold us the house we bought, didn't it? And they were the typical sort of, you know, American businesswoman style, sophisticated, rather hard-boiled, and <laughs> sharp. So they were sitting there on the sofa doing all their talking about houses. And I was down in my study. I wasn't there. My wife looked at one of them, <laughs> and she said, you know, I think your legs are unequal. <laughs> So, so the lady said, oh, do you think so? <laughs> and my wife said, would you like my husband to pray for you? <laughs> Before the lady could, you know, she wasn't used to that approach. <laughs> so I came out of the office and I said, let me measure your legs. And one was longer than the other. The short leg grew out. So I moved over to the next lady. I said, let me check yours. <laughs> and you know, they really didn't know what had happened to them. And that grew up. So then I said to this second lady, I said, let me measure your arms. And she said, oh, no. She said, I couldn't take any more. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing was that the atmosphere in that room changed completely. In the next ten minutes, they were telling us all their inner problems and their <laughs> problems with their husbands and their children and all sorts of things. So, and that we'd broken down that hard exterior shell. Well, anyhow... We started looking for a house, and then I went away on a preaching trip, and my wife didn't come with me, and uh, she phoned, I phoned one night, and she said, I think I found the house. So, you know, the first thing a husband always says, you know that, don't you? What's the price? Yeah. <laughs> so she told me, I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> we are never going to buy a house in that price. But the Lord kept on dealing, and no matter what happened, there was always that house. So in the end, we signed the contract. And we had a closing date, and I had to come up with well over $20,000 that I hadn't paid. And we got that money 23 hours before the closing. I got $25,000. Now, why I'm saying that is because I had no ambition to move into a better home. I was not covetous. In fact, when I first got to this area where we live now, which is a rather exclusive residential area, I walked around thinking I really don't belong in a place like this. I'm only driving a Buick, and everybody else is driving a Cadillac or a Lincoln or something like that. But I, I give that testimony because from the time that we moved into that new house, I would have to say my income doubled for no specific reason. I didn't do more. I didn't try harder. I didn't pray more. I just took the step. Now, if I had never taken that step, I would never have moved on to that higher level. Now, that's a financial level. And again, I want to say finance isn't everything, but it is something. I don't believe in people that say money isn't important. They only talk like that in front of church. The moment they get out, they show by their actions, they think it's very important. I, I hope I can say this in the right way. Today, a thousand dollars means as much to me as a hundred dollars did ten years ago. I think in terms of thousands when I used to think in terms of hundreds. Now, that doesn't make me super spiritual. 
but it's an example of coming up to a higher level. Now there's many, many different levels, many different areas of life, but you'll always find when God is going to take you up, there's going to be a step of faith. No step of faith, no program. I could give you half a dozen passages of scripture for that, but I'm just speaking out of personal experience as a change. If you want to go to Israel, entering their inheritance, the promised land, what lay between them? The river Jordan. And they had to cross, no bridge, no boat. And the Jordan was in flood. That's how the your Lord usually arranges it. When you have to cross your Jordan, it's usually not just the usual level, it's in flood. Because if God's going to do it, it doesn't matter to him whether it's in flood or not. And if the orders that God gave to Joshua to give to the priest was, you take the ark, walk ahead of the people, and put your feet in the water. And the water didn't stop flowing till they put their feet in the water. I cannot tell you how many times in my life, in one way or another, I've had to put my feet in the water. And then the water stand up. You say, I want to see the water stand and then I'll walk in. No, God says, you walk in, put your feet in, I'll see to the water. That I believe it's an unvarying law. There is no progress without faith. All right, that's the first principle. Now the second one, I want to read some scripture. I want to read three passages of scripture. I am getting rather cautious about what I preach because I always end up having to practice it. 